The Giant Killers by Conway Fitzgerald Chapter 19 In the aftermath of the battle, the two dwarves named Hansen and Dorby, who remained invisible as observers throughout the fight, were astonished by what our small group of men had achieved. Our kill count was 250 orcs. The rest fled. A dozen ogres, 42 humanoids, and the capture of two stray stone giants. These giants were being used by Craddocks to help construct the burrows that we had lured the orcs out of. We assessed their neutrality, charmed them, and took them on as laborers for our own construction purposes. The orcs had some of the castle's lesser treasures in their possession. We recovered very little of value, except for the sentimentality the clergy attached to these items. Later, the two dwarves sought us out for an audience. They complimented us, finding our kill tally quite impressive. But it was what the orcs wore, and used as weaponry, that interested them most. This steel is of the highest grade. Orcs do not know how to found it. Hansen opined. Theos Khan and I inspected the armor with them carefully. Found it? Or even afford to be armed with it? I asked. This kind of scale armor must be very expensive to produce. And it's clearly of human design. But it does appear custom fit to Crodex himself. This kind of workmanship to be in the hands of orcs. Or even these aurogs. It's quite unnatural. I confirmed with Khan and Theos. Quell must have quite a bit of money at his disposal to equip his army of orcs this way. If this is any indication, added Theos. It's not the cost. You must understand, my human friends. It's the source. Henson sidestepped me and made his pitch directly to Khan and Theos. Great wizards, this metal is from the iron fields within the Golden Plateau, claimed Hansen, grateful to finally have the White Flame's ear. They must have gained possession of it. They must have taken it from the giants. Nonsense, retorted Dorby, the master builder. Orcs could never control the Golden Plateau. That is, and always will be in the possession of the Fire Giants. He paused and then looked over to us as if a secret had just slipped out clumsily from his lips. We all looked at the dwarves with incredulity. Theo spoke first. What is this Golden Plateau of which you speak and these Iron Fields? It was then I recalled the old story, vaguely. Legend tells it was the gift of the great Iron Titan named Brom, the father of all the giants who ruled from the tallest peak in the jagged cliffs. One day, he was angered. In his rage, he used his mile-long sword to smite his enemy. He missed and chopped off a mountain top, turning it into a massive plateau. It is told that revealed deep within the plateau is an endless supply of gold, silver, and iron. This was the giant's divine inheritance. Dorby told the story sarcastically suggesting it was simply lore, not based on reality. The iron fields lie there. The ore within is the finest anywhere. Steel from that ore can be made stronger than any other that is forged in the known world, added Hansen, who appeared to be floating the theory that this is where the ore for these weapons and armor worn by these lowly orcs, must have been sourced. If the orcs have weaponry like this, imagine the arms 
and armor manufactured by the fire giants. Hansen warned. That is why I came to you humans, to offer information. And this warning, the giants have imprisoned our people by the hundreds, forced them into slavery to forge new weapons and construct a new giant's fortress, Zai to Fetan. It has been completed, built into a mountain. It is impregnable. Stop wasting these fine men's time with such stories, demanded Dorby, eager to get the negotiations for construction back on track. I am here to rebuild this fortress, not feed their ears with such foolishness. Dorby demanded an audience with Fergus, as clearly none of us were able to promise him any money. He was getting impatient. We sought out Fergos, who was meditating in his sanctum, a hastily constructed shanty that was located on the grounds of the once spectacular All God's Church, which now lay in ruins all around him. As the cold fall rains fell mercilessly on the wrecked castle at Voss, Fergos' sanctum was among the few places that offered shelter. Fergos welcomed the dwarves inside and allowed Dorby an opportunity to pitch his plan. Fergos listened intently, surrounded by his comrades. All of us were there, save the new fighters and Thon scouts, who were working on expanding our security perimeter. Theb heeded my warning to remain outside the sacked castle, and spent most of his time inspecting the orc caves for survivors and coin, and the surrounding areas for information. Seeing that dark elf female, the drow high priestess that took Ozzy's body, had really scared him in ways I had never seen him scared before. But I'll expound more on that later. Dorby discussed his inflated projections of cost, and then elaborated on his time frame to develop his workforce and acquire the necessary raw materials. Khan and Theos showed him their drawings, after he agreed that any knowledge of this castle's construction would require a memory wipe. Before anyone's wiping out my mind, I want to see a deposit. I figure at least a thousand in gold to begin. He said almost certain he would never get that. As a showing of good faith. Another ten thousand to complete it. Dorby demanded. I figured this was where this negotiation would implode, as clearly none of us had anywhere near that kind of money. Agreed, said Fergus, to most of our complete surprise. Fergus motioned for Reg to bring in the cart that held the trunks of cash that was gifted by King Owen. We all looked at him quite surprised. I didn't say I wouldn't accept it. He smiled at us. Over the next several months, as fall turned into winter, and winter returned to spring, several hundred more dwarves made their way to Voss from their ancestral homelands. Many trekked thousands of miles from the lands between the northern wastelands and the endless wood. As expected, so did other humans, elves, gnomes, and havelings, all looking for opportunities to befriend the order and earn a prosperous living. Among them were adventurers and treasure seekers, tradesmen and refugees. Many were the purported relatives of the former inhabitants of Vaz, claiming rights to lands and homes left in ruins by the invasion of the Horde. Fergos did his best to arbitrate, and the Paladins created a makeshift police force to stop the many little battles that ensued, before they got completely out of hand. As the spring thaw gave way to warmer rain, the flowers and budding of trees returned to the river valley. The grasslands were once again green, feeding sheep, goats, and heifers. The populations of all the surrounding villages multiplied quickly as more people returned from their places of hiding. It was in the village of Bol that I returned to find Theb. He had been avoiding me all winter. 
He had taken residence in a small abandoned house near the edge of the village. He had remained there unnoticed until the rightful owners returned to claim it. Reg had been called to evict the small man from the house, but I convinced him to let me try first. I rapped on the door twice and he did not respond. Then I knocked the door open with magic. The door creaked open and I could see firelight within. I stepped forward but did not see him. Well come then, but close the door. The cold of this land aches my bones. Theb complained, slamming the door behind me. I looked into his eyes and saw he was worse than before. Fear had consumed him. It was so unnatural for him that it frightened me as well. Where have you been? I asked, frustrated. He had broken our normal routines of checking for my signs, remaining instead in this tiny hovel, hiding. I've been doing what your new master asked, remaining outside the castle. But you haven't observed my many summonses. As I spoke, his eyes left mine for the window slots on the door. How did you find me? I heard there was an angry gray man who threatened a peaceful returning family, claimed he would carve out their eyes and feed them to goats if they returned. I remember you taught me that line. It's a good threat. I smiled. He did not. Well, now one of the paladins is here to evict you. By force, if necessary. You really scared those people, Theb. Why did you- I am scared, Eirmine. I am. Why do you care about these people? They are not our people. Now we are known. I warned you. He said frantically, his eyes darting from side to side, then back into the windows. Who was she? I asked. She saw me, Eirmine. Her eyes looked right through me. She was so beautiful, so terrifyingly perfect. Much like in the world of humans, charisma and physical beauty mattered most to the Dark Elves. Among the Drow Elves, the more beautiful, certainly the more powerful. This witch, whoever she was, was clearly going to be a big problem for us. Well, let's catch her and kill her then, I said overconfidently. No, you don't understand. We are seen, Ermine. Both of us, they know us now, all of us. It's just a matter of time. Have you seen any more of them? I asked. He shook his head, turning his gaze through a small window. He had spent far too many hours throughout the day searching through that small piece of foggy glass for shadows lurking in the trees. No, I don't know why. Why don't they come? He said, gripping his broadsword tightly. Because we are safe here. I have very powerful friends now, Fen. They call Fergos the Great Seer because he can see everything. Her as well. We can take her. We will. I wasn't a very talented liar. But I will admit, I hadn't even seen her. And I was scared of her too. But I had to believe that my purpose was to be found here, with these humans now. Theb did not share that belief. I saw my death in her eyes, in her gaze. I could see my long life ending. A tear escaped his thin gray cheek. I had never seen that before. I then embraced him, as I had never done before. It was awkward, but necessary. I killed her once, but she did not die. 
She returned. She lives. We'll find her. And we'll kill her. For good. It's written in the stars. It is my purpose, right? And your sworn quest, remember? We can do it, Theb. I need you. I attempted to borrow on Dan's confident mannerisms, but I wasn't nearly as good at it. But Theb agreed to leave the house with me without making a scene. Afterwards, I managed to move him discreetly to a safe house closer to the castle that wouldn't be allowed any reclamation. It was sanctioned by Frogos himself, though its location remained anonymous to everyone other than us. I assured Theb of this. He did feel safer there. I made my home with him for a while, though I ached to be with Dan always. But Theb needed me, and I needed him. That much was certain. My presence helped Theb regain his much-trusted nerve, however slowly. The triangle was now secure, and the inner sanctum of the sacred fire, the one Dan had envisioned with the sparrows and the stolen threads, was among the first portions of the castle to be restored. It was there Fergus called his first official meeting of the Order. There was some anticipation to learn of what Fergos would do to restore the Triumvirate. Many lords, mages, and clerics made pilgrimages that spring to Castle Voss to try to achieve a place in the new, restored sacred fire. Khan was expected to take the mantle of High Mage, as he had spent several more months back at Are and Shalpachare, establishing new followers and expanding his research of the ancient arts. Most expected Dan to be named the new High Lord, though Dan himself felt that either Than, Reg, or Kiantan would be much better suited for that role, which was far too restrictive and administrative for his tastes. Meanwhile, Dorby and his many dwarven cousins and peers continued to swell in and compete amongst each other for an ever greater slice of the growing construction pie. Dorby demanded greater and greater sums of money to complete the project. The budget had ballooned to 25,000 by spring. The deposit suddenly seemed far insufficient for Dorby to pay his many workers. This, and the arrival of the dwarf named Welki, who claimed to be a refugee from Zaitafetan itself, prompted our first official meeting at the new Castle Voss. Welki arrived in Dan's dreams the night before he made his first appearance. This was unfortunate, because when a man feels he has seen his dream become reality, it is very hard for him to be persuaded otherwise. So it was with the dwarf, Welki Dawncutter. Dan had many recurring visions and dreams of late, he told of being awoken in a foreign place. It was dark and nondescript. Though he knew not where it was, he knew with frightening certainty his destiny awaited him there. His fate and his promised vengeance could both be found there, in that unknown dark house. He had spoken of this vision with Fergos and myself many times. He described an unusually wiry dwarf, missing an eye, who led the way to that place. I explained my mistrust of dwarves to him and all of the flame, but to no avail. I was amazed at how even Fergos was prone to believe their many tall tales with smiling relish. As far as he could tell, they spoke the truth, though it was always shrouded in a haze of legend and vague prophecy, as usual. That's what made dwarves such famous soothsayers and fantastically successful liars. They had faces that just seemed naturally harmless and believable. As more dwarves arrived in Voss, I tried especially hard to dissuade Dan from believing any of Hansen's stories. But Dan was insistent. I could see him observing each new dwarf he met for clues. He inspected them, 
as if to see whether they perhaps were attached to this little man in his vision, or had any clues to reveal where the one-eyed dwarf could be found. Dan befriended many of them, asking routinely if they had ever seen such a dwarf. With so many dwarves making residence in Vosnau, Dan assured me he had begun to assume this vision was simply an impression, a riddle from the gods, but not a reality. He then became melancholy and reticent, for when a human man loses his dream, the one he thought was his divine quest, his soul begins to die. That is when Welki arrived. Great seer, our men apprehended a straggler on the road, a lone dwarf. He claims to have important information, but only for your ears. Told Kiontan to his high priest. He must be a spy, Fergus, said Than. It would be beyond miraculous for a lone dwarf to survive the winter in the borderlands, or even in human lands, in this manner. He has no weapons, no gear, not even shoes. Fergus nodded, yet he allowed the dwarf the audience he'd requested. Like Dan, he too had seen him coming. When they found Welki, he was an extremely emaciated dwarf, filthy and clothed in rags. He was missing his left eye. In fact, the entire left side of his face was seared by what looked like the work of a hot iron that had been lodged into the eye socket, quite grotesquely. When Welki was brought to the nearly completed new chapel, Reg and Kiontan attempted once again to detect evil about him. They found none. Than had interrogated him prior to his arrival. His story, or what he told them thus far, he found mostly credible but not enough to merit a face-to-face -face meeting with Fergus. He told the sad, begging dwarf that repeatedly, but Welki persisted. He insisted the great seer would know the truth. Than could not argue with that. But to Than's dismay, Fergus welcomed Welki right away into the new All-Gods Temple with much anticipation. Many dwarvish laborers, nobles, Holy men and fighters, including Dorby and Hansen, arrived to hear his tale in person. When Welki entered, the chatter within ceased completely. He was a spectacle, for sure. The steps of his soiled and calloused bare feet could be heard pattering the stone floor as he approached the altar with uncertain steps. My word, Master Dwarf, you appear to have not eaten in weeks? Fergus asked benevolently. The dwarf fell to his knees before Fergus. I have not, great seer, the starving dwarf said humbly. His voice was gruff and weak. Just what I could catch and forage on my own. The last of his body's moisture was spent on the tears which swelled on the right side of his face. And these rags you wear, you're practically naked. Where have you come from without food, or even clothes on your back? Sigh, Tifetan, great seer, the forge in the mountain, the fire giant fortress, he said. The dwarves in the temple gasped and called out many things in dwarvish tongue. Then they gathered others as he spoke on. By a miracle of the gods, I've escaped that hell and come all this way to beg you, great seal, for your help. His right cheek carried the last tear his remaining eye could muster. I must admit, despite my genuine distrust of all dwarves, I actually bought the story as well. I was moved. Well, let us get you fed, bathed and dressed, so we may hear more about your plight, 
and see the crisis involving your people met. The dwarves present cheered passionately with approval. Virgo signaled his newly elected clergyman to get right on that. Great seer, I must tell you, I must... <laughs> Welke coughed out, struggling for words. He gasped for air as he spoke, desperate to ensure he gave this message to Fergos before he expired. Welke used the last of his remaining strength to tell why he had come. One of the clergy offered him a drink of water. He guzzled at the brass chalice until it fell to the stone floor. He wiped his chaffed lips. The giants have gathered much strength. They have allied with the Dark Elves. They have enslaved my people. Hundreds of us stolen from our homes. Merciful one, please help us. Please free my people from the... <coughs> he said as he collapsed into unconsciousness. The dwarves present were now up in arms. Hansen attempted to yell above the din, insisting boldly how he had been right all along. Others now claimed to be cousins to the Dawncutters, further corroborating this dwarves' tale. Many, they told, whole villages at times were said to have been kidnapped in the night by the Dark Elves and then sold into slavery to the giants in the jagged cliffs at Land's End. Fergus got up and laid his healing hands on Welke, but he was not sure that was enough to save him. Quickly, take him to the infirmary. Help him. Get him cleaned, clothed, and fed, Fergos commanded. The clergyman lifted Welke up on a flatboard and took him away. Many dwarves followed. I looked about the room to Than, then to Theos, then to Khan. Besides Than and Kiontan, none of the other fighters were present. Then it dawned on me. Dan was not there either. I wasn't sure where he was. But I left the All God's Church fervently and then ran towards Dan's quarters as fast as I could. As I sprinted through the human populace, it occurred to me I may not get to him quickly enough. So I jumped through a dimension door brazenly to get even closer. I had to intercept Dan first before he heard about this from anyone else. My stomach churned. When I reached Dan's door, I was intercepted by two of his new teenaged fighter followers that had been camped out on his porch. They blocked my path to the door. Where are you going? asked one. What's it to you? I am a member of the Sacred Fire. Stand aside. The first boy stepped aside. The other then got in the doorway. Milady, he's indisposed at the moment. Wouldn't you prefer to check back later? The pimply squire asked. I could hear a woman moaning within. Is he in there with someone, boy? I asked. He tried not to speak, but then nodded. Thanks. I smiled at him. He smiled back. Then I rapped on the door. Dan! It is I, Tia, your fellow member of the Sacred Fire. I looked back to the boys smiling, who had the look on their faces of dead men walking. I knocked again. Dan, I need to speak with you at once. The door opened suddenly, but only a crack. Dan's head protruded. Eirmai, what are you doing? He had no shirt on. Dan. We need to speak now, I whispered. Now is not a good time, Aermine, he said, a bit perturbed, looking back towards his bed, and then to me again. Dan, we need to talk now. There's something very important I need to tell you, 
I said again, insistently. It was at that moment his eyes fell from mine, quizzically. Dan seemed to be receiving another message, one that I could not hear. Moments later, after he listened to what seemed like a summons, he looked back to me. <sighs> Give me a minute. The door closed. Within that minute, he emerged with a woman, who he then whispered to, and she called out with a barrage of curses. Dan did not console her or look back, but started marching briskly as he dressed himself. He walked with determination directly towards the All God's Temple, directly towards the Great Seer. Who was that? I asked, reflexively. What? No one. <sighs> he said, a bit irritated by the intrusion and the question. Dan. He slowed his walk momentarily. He looked back at me, then turned and kept going. I followed closely behind. Dan, this is too perfect. Too easy. He's not what you think. I know it. I really didn't know it, to be honest. But the notion of Dan being presented with this ironclad acknowledgement of his dream, this most succulently baited lure, was certainly not a portent of something that could end well. I was certain of that. It smelled of deception, something I was well versed in. Dan stopped at the entrance of the All God's Church and then turned again to face me. His left arm was extended, as if to suggest I had followed him far enough. I've been summoned by the Great Seer. Will you excuse me? In his eyes, I saw a zealous determination. There was no stopping this. He entered the newly constructed temple briskly and did not hold open the heavy double doors for me to follow. So as he marched towards this destiny, I remained behind, powerlessly, at the doors that came to a solid close. I felt though I had lost him again. My eyes welled with tears as I turned to my left. There was Thon, seated on a bench on the porch outside the new temple. His eyes met mine. I sat beside him. Thon, you don't believe this dwarf actually escaped from the giant's fortress, do you? That's what he believes. He said. I looked at him for clarification. The dwarf, I mean. But there are so many other dwarves here that Dan described this vision too. Some of which you must agree don't have this place's best interest in mind. Thon nodded. Wouldn't you also agree? This is all a little too perfect? Almost like he was created to match this description? Normally, I would agree with you, Tia. In fact, I did not wish to bring this dwarf inside the grounds at all. But Fergus was expecting him. I looked at him with shocked disbelief. There are powers at work here that, frankly, I cannot understand. But I trust Fergus with my life. You should too. He said, as his eyes met mine. But why Dan? Why is he so sure of this vision? He told me just last week it was only an impression, a dream that only the gods could reveal. Maybe they have, Thon said stoically. Dan walked briskly down the length of the new chapel which led to the altar and dias where Fergus prayed. He stopped at the base of the altar and looked up to his old friend whose eyes then opened with a smile. He has arrived. It is time, Fergus said confidently. I am eager. We are ready, Dan replied. The two of them had been sharing their visions, Dan of the one-eyed dwarf and of the path which led to victory. Fergus of the bubble in hell, which rose above and out of the control of Moscow's reach. They were in agreement these recurring visions were tied together, and now these portents had come to fruition. 
The call of the gods had finally come. His name is Welki Dawncutter. He claims to have escaped the impregnable fortress that Hansen described. It is real. It is there. And it must be destroyed. And we're certain he speaks the truth. He can really lead us there? Dan asked. I'd like to think my desperate warnings had something to do with this extra request for verification. He spoke no lies. Fergos responded. He was imprisoned there, as are many of his people. He escaped and made the trek through the jagged cliffs, across the borderlands, and all the way here on his own. His presence is miraculous. Why is he important to the vision, Great Seer? We knew the Fortress of the Giants was there. What message does he bring that we needed to hear? Not us. It was his brethren who needed to hear it. For now, they will construct this castle with a passion and fervor that no amount of coin could ever inspire. This is our mission, our trade pact, and our road to victory. It is a path for the redemption of our order. Fergus said knowingly. Dan nodded. In the following days, this pact Fergus described came to be. The dwarves, rallied and inspired by their own priests and warlords, agreed to complete the castle Voss by the ancient ways. They would complete the construction for no further cost, but in exchange for the chance of freedom for their brethren. I was both impressed and alarmed at the vagueness of Fergus's language when he described what we would do. The White Flame agreed to destroy the giants and topple their fortress and allow for the dwarves to escape, but he made no promise to lead the dwarves back from Land's End. That's what I found alarming. Welke claimed, with the giants slain, the dwarves would be free, and he could lead them all home from there. That was his divine purpose, knowing the path. Our sole role was to vanquish the last bastion of the giants, something we were already inclined to do and uniquely qualified to accomplish. The only problem was the giants were not alone. With the Dark Elves as their allies, they would have eyes everywhere. With Quell as their ally, they would have human assistance and his concentrated forces of darkness at their disposal. This mission wasn't going to be easy. So we all met to forge our strategy. Fergus, Kiantan, Reg, Dan, and Than, Ushvin, Kane, and Gladius and Tai, Khan, Theos, and myself, and about 20 or so new arrivals. These new arrivals were young, lesser experienced fighting men, clerics, and mages, all hoping for a chance to make the mission with us as giant killers. Please be seated, said Fergos, and all those gathered became silent and took their assigned seats in a circle about the hall. Before we discuss the matter at hand, there is something I wish to announce. I will now name the new triumvirate. The room hushed, and all the young vanguards present eagerly awaited to see which one of us would be named as their new leaders, and who they would turn to in order to curry favor. But Fergus's announcements surprised everyone. Our new High Lord, trainer, military leader, and master of arms shall be Tarhichi To. There began a silent murmuring throughout the hall. Each of us and all of the young prospects turned to each other to see if anyone knew who that was. As I would learn many years later, he was a four-year-old human boy, currently a refugee of the trade war, who was fleeing with his small remaining family among a caravan somewhere in the central desert. I was very surprised by Dan's lack of a reaction. It started to worry me greatly. Our new mage, 
teacher, regulator of the arcane, shall be Zianochi. Once again, a strange yet unknown name, like Tarhichi Tull. Zian was a nine-year-old girl living somewhere in a field in the Great Eastern Empire. But no one in the room would or could know that for many years to come. Most of the young humans present would never survive to see them seated in those places of distinction. But it was Fergus's last and most unexpected announcement that took all of us by surprise. Our new high priest. Fergus's clergy gasped, as even they too were completely unknowing of this announcement. Motivator, arbiter of justice, and connection to all the gods shall be Dylan Spire. 400 miles to the north, in a small fishing village near Kirk, there lived a family named Spire. Three years later, they would have a son and give him the name of his grandfather, Dylan. By naming a new high priest, Fergus had just relinquished the role. There could not be more than one named high priest of the order. This was not a position that was earned through vote, riches, or ancestry, but by deeds and proven ability. That is why the great seer, naming a yet-to-be-conceived human to a role he would no longer occupy, confused all of us. It was then I got the notion that Dan and Fergos may have agreed on a suicide pact of sorts. I suddenly got the churning feeling that Theb was right. Again. As always. The triumvirate shall be restored when those I have named today have taken these seats. Fergus motioned to the empty seats and then his own. Ushvin Uribet will remain here as governor of Voss and regent of the territories within the Triangle. He shall arbitrate our laws with the help of some of our most talented scribes, scouts, and acolytes. If you are not currently a member of the White Flame, I now must ask you to leave. Fergos then stood up from the seat of High Priest and made his way off the DS to the incomplete and still unlit fire pit at the center of the room. We all formed a circle around it. When all of the initiates had left and the heavy oak doors slammed shut, Theo spoke first. Fergus, what is the meaning of this? We thought you intended to restore the Triumvirate, not eliminate it. I haven't, Theos. I have named the new Triumvirate. Fergus responded with a smile. Who are these people? And when will they arrive? Khan asked, nearly as impatiently as Theos. Fergus took a moment to calculate his best guess in his mind. Thirty? Maybe forty years? He said, smiling. This place should be completed by then. He said, confidently. Great seer. Said Ushvin, with his thick accent of the southern wilds. I am not a governor. Not a man. Knowledgeable of laws. I am a fighter. I cannot be that which you've commanded. Worry not, trusted friend. You'll get your chance soon enough. Fergus told him with his hand on his powerful shoulder. I looked to Than, who was clearly as vexed as the rest of us. He had also picked up on Dan's seeming inside information about the nature of the White Flame's future. All right. It's time to tell us all what's to come, Fergus. What is our next move? Than demanded. He was now a ranger lord probably the best in the known world. He was honorable and true, with an unbreakable fealty to the cause of justice. But his cautious nature was never quieted, even by the confidence of the great seer. I admired that of him and gravitated more to him than the others for that reason. Both Dan and I had a vision, 
a shared vision. This we believe to be a gift from the All Father. It is a key to the Castle of Truth and a path to breach the Gatehouse of Uncertainty. What was this vision? The one of the Dwarf? Do you really believe Welki to be this key? Thon asked suspiciously. No, said Dan to his old friend. The vision was of this place, he said, pointing to the newly reconstructed hall of the Sacred Fire. It was a vision of past, present, and future, he said, looking to me. Well, let us discuss the present, Khan demanded rather matter-of-factly. Clearly, you've got a plan in mind. Like Thon said, I think it's time you shared it with us. We must go to Land's End, to the Jagged Cliffs, to find and destroy the castle Didok, Quell's new temple of evil. With Quell and his minions vanquished, we can focus on our second objective, the destruction of the castle of the fire giants, the one the dwarves call Zaitifetan. There, we will end the threat posed by the giants forevermore and deal with these dark elves that inspire them. Sounds logical to me, Theos pronounced to all. But why then have you relinquished your role in the Triumvirate? There was an uncomfortable silence in the hall for what seemed like an eternity before Fergus answered the question. I do not expect to return, Fergus said with less of a smile. Neither should any of you. Where we are going, no man has ever returned. I don't expect that to change. After the meeting of the White Flame, where it was now foretold that all of our fates were sealed, Thon and I discussed what we should do to ensure we weren't being led into a trap. He agreed with me that if we convinced the mages, Khan and Theos, to caucus with us, we could double check this dwarf's story and make sure we weren't being duped to our deaths. Fortunately, Fergus agreed. A subsequent meeting was arranged with all the dwarves, ostensibly to solidify our pact with them. All of the major representatives of the little tricksters would now be put under the most stringent magical and spiritual scrutiny. I anticipated we would see through their guise, and I'd later be thanked for saving us all. Great Seer, my name is Orin of Mountain Glow. I am the High Priest of the Dwarvish people. I have come from the lands between the Northern Wasteland and the Endless Wood, from the place where the Mountain Forge burns eternal, to offer my service to you and your mighty warriors. It is I who will lead the families of Dawncutter. Bulcher, and Remyon, from bondage and back to their homes. On behalf of all the many dwarves of the northern expanse, I thank you for your service. The dwarvish holy man bowed to the great seer. Fergo smiled and offered prayers in return. Great seer, my name is Kuro also from the lands and the mountains that glow. I am the mightiest of our great fighters. I offer my hammer, with which to aid your great cause, and break the chains that bind my people. One by one, several other dwarves made their way to Fergos and his surrounding paladins to offer their fealty to this great cause. Khan and Theos remained unseen, watching each one closely, attempting to detect lies or evil intent. When Welki came before us, I injected my own line of questioning. Welki of the Dawncutters, have you ever met Quell Tavor? I asked. Uh, I have not. I do not know that name. Quell did not send you here? I asked directly. I do not know this Quell. I escaped. You escaped from Zai to Fetin. Were you aided by anyone? I asked again, his one remaining eye fixed on mine and welled with tears. 
I came alone. I had no help, he answered. What is the meaning of these questions, Elf? He speaks the truth, cried Orin, quite insulted by my line of questioning. The other dwarves clamored with disapproval at my being able to even speak at this gathering. But I persisted. Have you ever encountered the Dark Elves? The Drow? And the room fell silent. I have... Nodded Welky. Terrible beings. Dark. Treacherous. There is one we know of. A beautiful Dark Elf. A leader among them. Have you seen her? I asked pointedly. The, f- the females lead them. Yes. The more beautiful... The more powerful. Yes. He answered. What is her name? I asked. He simply shook his head, muttering. Once again, the dwarves demanded an explanation. I imagined her personally thrusting the flaming pike into his eye socket. Uh, I do not know what you mean. I could see Fergus was concentrating on every word. Well, he couldn't now lie and get away with it. I had him right where I wanted, or so I thought. Did they aid your escape, Welki? Did she lead you here? The dwarves' protest now became violent. One flung a chair towards me. Another charged me with his axe. He exclaimed as he charged. Stop. Fergus commanded, and the dwarf was frozen in his tracks. Fergus then stepped down purposefully from his high seat and approached Welki. He placed his right hand on the battered dwarf's head. Answer the question, Master Dwarf. Were you aided by these dark elves? I was not, Great Seer. I escaped them. They are evil. I am innocent. Welki then collapsed into Fergus' arms. He held the dwarf lovingly and looked over to me, approving of his story. Fergus believed it. I still had my doubts. There was something he wasn't telling us. Even if he was innocent as he claimed, he may very well have been acting unwittingly. I tried to explain this to Fergus and the mages, but to no avail. The dwarves took Welki away. Orin and Krog were furious with me. They shoved me aside with their stocky bodies and demanded an answer from Fergus. Well then, Great Seal, are you satisfied? Do we have a deal? Asked the dwarves. We do. Fergus smiled back at them. The dwarves sneered and huffed at me as they left the room in order. I looked at Thon, whose suspicious eyes met mine. His gaze seemed much more accepting of his fate. He looked away. Khan and Theos both agreed they could detect not even the hint of deception from any of them. They suggested instead that perhaps I should try to temper my prejudice of the race of dwarves. Yeah, I thought, perhaps I should. Lastly, I turned to Dan. He was my reason for being here. And if I was going to die on this mission, it would be following him. What do you see in this dwarf? I asked him. What dream or vision has your god given you to trust him? To be sure that he will lead us safely to Zaitifetan. Dan then offered me another patently sublime smile. He placed my shoulders firmly in his hands. Don't be afraid, he said. I'm not afraid, I'm just... You, Hermine, the vision is of you. You are the future. Don't be afraid. Thanks so much for watching. If you haven't yet, please be sure to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. If you'd like to support the production of this audiobook, please consider being a Patreon supporter. It's never too late to share a comment Please let me know what you think about this chapter and any questions you may have. 
And as always, be sure to like and share with all your friends on your favorite social media.